Zayla. Where are we going today, Zayla? Where are we going today? Where are we going today? All right, come on, get in your spot. Place, place. Get comfy, we got a little bit of a ride. You can play with your ball, there you go. So today, Sierra and I are going out to Zach Bauer's place of an American homestead and new to Torah. And uh, we're really excited because one day we hope to upgrade from this deal back here to a good homestead where we can uh, have animals and some veggies and uh, work the land. And uh, not that I want to be a farmer, but it's, uh, it's how you can get out from underneath the government's thumb. And, um, and I'm not a crazy person either. I think that's just something that uh, self-sufficient people uh, should do. And we know that when all the shortages and stuff happened, those people that were already out working the land and had some property to start to develop, uh, they really weren't as affected as people that were really dependent on the cities and stuff. And so that's why I love the whole premise of homesteading and going out there. And so Sierra and I and uh, Zayla, our pup, are going to be going on to uh, Zach's place and checking it out. And uh, we're going to be making a couple little videos there. And hope you guys enjoy. See you over at the American Homestead. <laughs> you want to play ball so bad, don't you? <laughs> oh, boy. Did you grab the flash stuff? Yep. So we're going to go check out Zach Bauer's homestead. Um, and he's going to be teaching us a little bit about uh, wine and how he makes his homemade wine. He's going to show us around the homestead a little bit. And uh, Sierra is really excited because it's uh, something that she's always wanted to do is have a little bit of land and, and her dad has animals and stuff. So she grew up on the farm. I, of course, was a city slicker. I grew up in uh, Manila, Philippines, so a city of 20 million people. Uh, but, you know, we, we always saw kind of the rural farmers kind of out in the, the sticks there when my dad was doing mission trips. And um, it is possible for people to live off the grid, be self-sufficient, and um, hopefully we'll learn some of that whenever we go and visit Zach. And uh, I'm really excited. You know, I remember uh, years back um, looking into Torah for the first time. Uh, trying to figure out, you know, how do people keep these commandments? And I stumbled across this guy who's like, hey, we're all new to Torah. And uh, his name was Zach Bauer. And uh, it was, uh, I think it might have been back um, before he even moved out to their homestead there. I remember seeing a little uh, Hanukkah behind him in, in a house or something. And, uh, and of course, you know, he eventually moved out to the homestead. But I don't know, I might have been watching an old video <laughs> But anyways, um, yeah, Zach was a, a big instrumental part for me and, and my early walk. And uh, I've bumped shoulders with him over the years at a lot of conferences and um, and really just appreciate kind of uh, his get-go, gusto, non, no-nonsense type of approach to scripture and, and different political agendas and, and things like that. So um, it's a breath, breath of fresh air uh, with all the politicized, you know, fakeness out there and um, and Zach's pretty, you know, cut and dry and, uh, give you it as it is. So looking forward to hanging out and, uh, we're going to be on the road here for a little bit heading that way. Drink stop. Are you excited to go? Thumbs up. I have a, a, uh, symptom. Cellular. I was gonna say uh, y your events and symptoms of uh, of the pregnant n nature. Are you excited to go visit Zach Bauer? So uh, you lived on a farm. Why is it important for people to homestead? You want to eat. It's kind of nice to have food. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to eat, um, what about uh, what about animals and uh, like? being off grid 
what, what do you think about that stuff? I think it's really important. Really important? Yeah. Why is it important? <laughs> well, you're growing your own food, you're not reliant on others for your livelihood, and it brings you closer to scripture because you can actually understand some of the things Torah is talking about. Cool. Getting back to the land. We're in the backwoods now, y'all. <laughs> Sierra's like, you got 10 minutes of gravel road? I don't know. I'll take it easy on your car, babe. I promise. Zayla's, Zayla's having a good time. She's uh, riding with us. We're going slow, though. We're going slow. Here we come. American Homestead. Here we come. <laughs> We're still on the gravel road, just checking in, and uh, and Zayla's like, "Come on, are we there yet? Are we there yet?" <laughs> Look at that! He's got his wood mill and stuff down there. That's sweet sweetness. What do you think, Sierra? You think we can do something like this one day? Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. You know what? We got here seven years ago, so it's going to be a seven-year rest. Yeah. So I think it's actually not really good. You know, with Jamie passing and having that time to go in the mouth. I go, yeah. So there's a blackberry back there. I mean, there's all kinds of good. Tell us some stuff. It's going to be good. You usually have to stay with tomatoes. We'll find it next to Jamie's place in the next two weeks. All this is shut down. Different things on it. And then we'll get it growing next spring, get it ready for a bit. It'll overwinter that way. So is this mostly uh, berries and stuff, or do you play other things? I don't know. This long, I mean, yeah, we have berries, we have raspberries, we have peaches, we have another fruit, cucumbers, cabbages. Yeah, this is like the full garden area. But we'll cut everything down, manure it, and it'll sit that way over the winter. And then come spring, we raise plants. So since you're in the seventh year of rest, what do you think that does to the land? It just kind of like a, a physical... Or like I don't know, like they're doing theories. So I mean it says let the land land rest. And that was like one of the big reasons he went for taking in for last. Yeah. So uh it's pretty important obviously. <laughs> keep it as you can. <laughs> yeah. Right, so keep it as you can, that's what we're doing. So um, he didn't really do anything with the judge was going to overgrow. And I, I kinda think that with everything growing, it's it's allowing the flow to do what it does. You know, the microbes and stuff in there, I and mean, all this stuff is going to die back and be uh, compost for the following year. So I think that adds something to the soil when you do that. Wow, that's cool. So maybe that's a, maybe that's one reason he hasn't been to let the soil renew itself. And so uh, you don't have all the plants growing over the nutrients. Right, right. And so, so you're actually kind of putting that back. Maybe it's what the soil needs. And so I don't know. That's, that's his design. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Her family's got a pretty cool testimony about keeping the. the Sabbatical years, uh, they, they like had like a. They, they, it was the first time they were keeping. They had like a bunch of debts returned. Like it, they had a pretty cool little story there. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, there's something good. Yeah, there's something good. So I'm looking forward to like the next. Like I was working on my truck today. As soon as my truck is fixed, uh, I have a pickup. Nine o'clock today. It's not how long will the battle take? Uh, a couple days. A couple days. I right? try to keep the time for that. This is a battery bank. It's eight batteries for deep cycle batteries, and uh, specifically for solar, solar. And it's got an inverter. The inverter runs through the house. Uh, solar panels come into this combiner box, and from the combiner box into the um, charge controller. And this tells the system if it needs to be charged or not. And so if it if it's full, this will shut it off. Oh, wow. and then from the battery banks, this this goes in the battery banks, and the battery banks to there, and into the house. So how many batteries can you stack up to? Hey, you want? So, like, if you want, you can fill this whole thing up with batteries mm -hmm. and, and last a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, right now it'll last two or three days if I did if it was cloudy days. But I wouldn't want it to get that low. Yeah. I would want it to... That's bad for the batteries yeah, if they get low. Yeah, you got to lower the lifespan of the batteries. So that's why we have the, the this battery charger. It's a three-stage charger, so it powers them in a certain way to keep them healthy. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is a lifesaver, battery lifesaver. Also, it's a pulse throughout the batteries to keep them healthy. So you can make these batteries last, you know, in a climate-controlled environment, maybe eight years. You know, this would probably last, they say, you know, five or six because they're outside. And these are all specific for solar power? Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you can jerry rig a bunch of car batteries. <laughs> like, no, you no, you do it. You, you, Worst case you, scenario. You could do that, but those aren't deep cycle batteries. Those are um, what they call those cool cranking batteries. And so they're lead acid. They're not going to last. You, you'll kill them pretty quick. Gotcha. Yeah. I kill them already as it is. Just yeah. Drive them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, you got to get the right type of batteries. But once you do, they, they last a long time. They, they've been doing really good for us. And, you think about the money I'm saving, like, I haven't had an electric bill in eight years. Wow. So, I mean, if I buy these batteries every six years, it's easy affordability. So, that's cool over there because we got a good deal on these. These are a little bit more powerful. These are 250 watts. These are 250 watts. Are the watts. So, I wanted to, we moved them around a little bit. So, that's why I got them that way. Yeah. Solar bags on here. Face of the south, so it heats them up. Or you can heat water in, put them in. And uh, come up here. Hello. <laughs> you can see you hang the solar bag in here, and it lifts up on a pulley system. So you can have a shower. So it's in a bag. You take the bag. And you ever seen those solar bags in the camping aisle? Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen them like in action. Yeah, yeah. Seen a yeah. Box or something. No, they have these big solar bags. You can get fit like three gallons in them. So it just heats up in the sun. You put it on the hook, lift it up, and then just grab it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. What do you think? You, you want to make something like this sometime? <laughs> uh, now I take showers in the running water. We don't use this. <laughs> Some people think we do. That's awesome. Uh, I, I used it for scope this year for sure. But um, we got about a thousand gallon, fifteen hundred gallon capacity, different bar collection, rain collection, about five thousand gallons capacity around the homestead. So we catch wow. we catch most of our water to use. That's awesome. We so, have wells, but we don't really use them anymore. So do you have to do any kind of like um, purification of the water, like no. it's just off the roof? Only for drinking. We have brickies for that. Gotcha. This yeah. time of year, I'll clean the gutters three or four times during the fall. Gotcha. So it doesn't get real nasty in there or anything, it's just run off? Yeah. That's fine. And the black tank keep mold from growing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, algae and stuff like that from growing in there. Yes. This is a little clear, so basically, I mean, it was overgrown, but we had to mow it down and kept on cleaning it down because I was thinking about it. I'll make it so that it's going to be around here. It's going to be around here. You got a YouTube channel? Yeah. All right. Wow. So what, what did you guys do with this? Uh, you can still kind of smell the, the, the floor. Yeah. What's it called? The stain? The polyurethane. The polyurethane. I've got to put another couple of coats of polyurethane yeah. on it. I need to get you up in here and mop it. Did you, you have a bunch of tables and stuff in here? Uh, usually chairs, and so there's a screen up front. You can drop that down in presentations. Um, we got a friend of ours who's going to see about getting us a flat screen for this. And uh, it's probably going to be a generator we put down there so we have a generator run. Run a while away. The way. lights and everything come on. So, yeah, that's uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, maybe rent it out for like weddings or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's not a lot of the places that people can go to. We used to put a fire extinguisher in here yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, we just recently, you know, a year and a half ago, we got married, and there's money to be made. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Locations. Yeah. Yeah. So, me and Jenny got married. We did it cheap. We did it in their backyard. <laughs> nice. Like, yeah. That's all I feel going in this yet. That's, you know? that's what we did. We got married in my, yeah. my father in law's back on their property. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Save the money. But, uh, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. From the back, the rabbis are saying that they'll have the name of the Messiah on their lid. No, the government can't do that. We did on homeschool, did on vaccines, did on all that stuff. So, 
it smells right now because we had an influx because of Sukkot. But normally you come out here, you don't smell anything. Gotcha. But when you have 100 people out here donating. <laughs> <laughs> but let me show you like this over here. This is our normal stuff. That you normally, you never see any flies. Yeah, you never even see really? flies out here normally. Wow. Even in the summertime. So it's like a multi-process. So like you bring the fresh stuff in and then what? You just... Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll dump it in here. And then we'll cover it with, because it's got the sawdust in it already. And then we have hay and straw that we put on top of there. And we keep in these bins over here. And then just let it compost. Now see, like see I'll, I'll empty this here in a week or two. And this is dirt. This. See, but see, when this was, when he, we finished with this, it was up here. Yeah. It's cooked oh, wow. down. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's turned to dirt. It's completely turned to dirt. Just dries out, like, I guess it, uh, what, you said it cooks? I've heard that compost no, it does. mounds can like blow up if you don't. Like, well, like they, they heat up or if something. If you don't properly store them, they can catch on fire. Uh, okay. I've heard of that happening, but that's rare. But if you keep them out open like this, uh, yeah, it cooks down. You'll you'll stick a temperature gauge down there, and you can get a reading of like 150 degrees, 140 degrees, and that's that's going to kill any pathogen, Whoa. harmful bacteria that, that could be present in there. Wow. So that's why they know it's safe after it's done, and so that's why because it's cooking, that's why you see it going from here to all the way down. So from the compost, you just are dumping sawdust and stuff on top of your your right. left leavings, and then you uh, because you can see, look at this, you can see the, the wood chip shavings. Okay. Okay. And then, then this have, is the kind of material you're dumping on on top, or is it? Well, then we use this inside to cover when we're using it. Gotcha. Okay. And then when we come out here, we put straw or hay on top. You see the hay? Yeah. Well, this is carbon. This is nitrogen. And when you mix the two, it it creates heat. And that's what does the cooking. And so breaking down of carbon, breaking down of nitrogen will produce heat. And that's what kills and cooks them and turns it back into dirt. So how large are these? Like, you guys got quite a few, but, like, how long does it take you to fill up a whole slot? Well, uh, anywhere a month and a half, two months. And so the whole process takes how long to a, a year. safe? A year. So be, I'll empty these in uh, September next yeah. year. So as long as you have maybe six, six ones, and then a, yeah. a you know a leftover one, that's how much it would take to do a whole year. Mm -hmm. Is it just how many? Is we left? have extra so we can rotate them. Got you, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Hmm. Yep. The first one we started came out here. We did pellets. They didn't last very long. And then he termite stuff. Yeah, he came mm -hmm. out here and he like rebuilt them all, and now they're like they can withstand all the time. Seeded. Yeah. Tree being seeded. Yep, it'll last a while. All of our fuel, gas cans, all of our kerosene for our lanterns, uh, motor oils, things like that. So how long does like this amount of fuel last generally? Like easy, I mean, easy a year. You can add additives to make it last longer, but we rotate through it also. Like these are empty. So like during the course of the year, or we'll run through and use them on the generators or other things. He's got generators down at his workshop, yeah. and so uh, these are ready. He'll probably go fill these up soon. And then uh, we'll stack them back up here. We'll use more twice as much fuel in the in the winter than we do in the summer. Gotcha. So you, you put that into a pick that into your account for when it comes for electricity, right? So I am saving a ton of money on electric bills. I am spending money on fuel. You know, every six years, you know, I may have to buy new batteries or something. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's. Uh, but still, when you add it all up, the savings. And I have a video on that. The savings are astronomical. So, uh, how much fuel does it take to keep your generator running when your panels are down? Um, not a lot. I mean, th these things are really efficient on gas. You know, you get what you pay for, so buy the most efficient generator you can. Yeah. That's a really nice Honda that he bought not that long ago. And it really sips the gas pretty good, and it puts out a good amount of power. So, I suppose if you had to, uh, for a full week, you didn't have any sun, you'd probably go through five gallons. Five gallons? In a week. Wow. Oh, that's if you had lot. to run it every day for six yeah, hours a day. Every day, if you had to do that, five gallons. But that doesn't happen for yeah. Well, but it has happened. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it does happen. Like there, there'll be times I'm like, goodness gracious, we haven't seen the sun for like a week. Yeah. And yeah, we're running the generator. Oh yeah. Usually yeah. you run it two to three hours. And yeah, it's good. Yeah. And is uh, is it like? So you have to buy the fuel for it. Is there? Is, uh, is it compatible with like? Like uh, you know, hard like fossil like uh, I don't know, like 
vegetable oil and stuff or you can make your own fuel but it's not those generators are not made for that it's uh, be you'd have to make some adjustments there are adjustment kits you can do those generators um to make them um, like if you couldn't make it into town at some point where are you gonna you know fuel your generator with yeah you, you can make your own ethanol which we can do that because we get a distiller you know like our sorghum will produce uh i have a fuel permit a federal fuel permit where i can make my own fuel um, oh. it's an ethanol like some cars will, will be able to use ethanol um, nowadays so uh, but for things like that, you have to put you have to put a kit on it to make it gotcha. take it. Yeah. yeah, we don't run gas with ethanol in the generators. Yeah, yeah, it's not good for it unless you put that kit on. It actually can ruin some of the gaskets and stuff. Oh, okay. We buy non-ethanol gas. Yeah. Huh. Yep. And uh, he just got finished digging this the other day, and then he'll build the root cellar and then he'll cover it up. So is this? The 52 degree temperature, like, like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it'll, it'll help keep the, the temperature of the root cellar at about 55, 60 degrees with a humidity of about 70% is what we're shooting for. So, how will you cover it up? Will you just build some framing and, and... no, he'll basically block it in. So, he'll pour the footers or a concrete pad right there, um, in, in those grooves, okay. and then he'll block up from there, the cinder block. And then we'll fill this in the box of concrete. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And then he'll cover it all up in dirt. There'll be a bunker too. It's just a makeshift <laughs> bunker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you can use it for a tornado shelter or whatever, but uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm looking at storing a lot of wine in there. Are you guys in Tornado Alley in this area? This is mountains. I mean, mountains, they, yeah. they touch down every once in a while, but everyone gets freaked, freaked out about it. But tornadoes don't like hills and woods, they like flat, open areas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like Kansas is so dangerous for tornadoes in parts of Missouri, you know? Yeah. They like those flat, open areas. Really windy. Yeah. Mountains are not t tornado friendly. But they do happen. They, they do happen. It's just rare. We get high winds out here, though. That's why we, we can use so, uh, wind power. It's kind of it easy to clean it out. We're going to clean it out this thing. I'm going to redo this pipe. But, so you clear the fire here. Okay. And it goes up the pipe and into the smokehouse. And by the time it reaches the smokehouse, most of the heat is gone, dissipated throughout the ground. And uh, when it comes out, it's about 80 degrees. So you have like a cold smoke. Wow. And so you can use it for per cured meats, preserved meats. Um, I, we put chicken in there. Um, oh, the best is if you like salmon. Yeah, we like salmon. So you take salmon, you put it in there for about two or three hours, uh, leave it in there, it's a cold smoke, two or three hours, and then put it in your oven for like 20 minutes to finish it off. The best salmon you've ever had in your life. Wow. So you can put like flavored woods in there and mm -hmm. get some like cherry wood. Hickory, I've used hickory, we've used cherry, you used, um, my favorite is maple. We'll use the smoke salt for maple wood. It has like a sweet tinge to it. Huh. Um, and then uh, it adds a sweet note on this, this smell. And then uh, well, we've used other fruits too. So you can basically put raw meats in there that have you put salt on them? Or? Uh, well, if they're cured, yeah. So you can put like a nitrite or nitrate salt, salted cured meat in there and yeah, smoke it. Yeah. How long will those last once you smoke them? Uh, if you put them in a root cellar like that, they'll last almost indefinitely, yeah. Because the humidity actually will form a mold on them, and the mold is good. It's actually a preservative for them. It actually adds more intense flavor. So you go into like the top sh Jewish charcuteries that are in um, New York City, they'll have the beef uh, salami, or the pork ones too. They'll have pork ones too, not, not the Jewish ones. But, um, <laughs> and they'll, have, they'll be covered in blue-green mold, hanging from the ceilings mm -hmm. in all their shops. Yeah. And it's a preservative. It's just an amazing flavor that adds to it. And the more you let it age, the more flavor intensity, intensity is going to increase. Wow. So you create like a humid environment like that, and you hang your stuff in it, and yeah. You got blue cheese and blue meat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you wash it off when, you know, it's time to eat it, but yeah, it's an amazing flavor. Wow. flavor. Yeah. That's cool. Or egg 
because they'll stop laying eggs if it's too dark. We need about at least 12 working hours. You guys have any trouble with uh, predators? Yeah. Yeah. How, what's this? They don't get in his coop though. He's got it built like Fort Knox. Yeah, it looks like Fort Knox. <laughs> <laughs> month or two, we we're having trouble with the bobcats. Yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 I want foxes, bobcats, um, raccoons at night. Oh, right. Um, and even possums will come in. But he, once they're sealed up in the house, it's, it's fine. But he's got this buried, like, this metal, sheet metal underneath here with a lock. They can't even dig to get underneath it. They have to start digging out here. You go all the way. You catch them before they got all the way. They wouldn't get that far. On the back side, Jason, you come out and you'll see where the rocks have been moved away. So they're trying. But they've never lost a bird inside. <laughs> so do you guys let them free roam and then they'll just kick off the phone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I can catch the chicken with that. Catch his legs. He's running away, you can swoop it and pull it towards you. The chicken catcher. Yeah. It's kind of like those, uh, the, like the stage thing where they have the uh, pull the guys off the stage. <laughs> So with 50, 50 chickens, how long will that feed you guys in terms of eggs and, and we use it for egg production, not really meat. You know, okay. okay. I, I like to keep about twenty. Two roosters and you know, fifteen, seventeen hens. Is there any eggs in there? Yeah, yeah there's an egg right here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's a it's a, a chicken apartment right here. That's your apartment complex. Apartment complex. How you doing, ladies? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Look it over. I have it divided into sections to where when the uh, birds start brooding, I put them on the back. Excuse me. They can stay away from all the drama. Oh, yeah. And so all the babies and the mom throw them on the back. And when they go, they look like they so, okay, so 50 chicken, 20, you said you keep roughly 20 at all times. Yeah. Um, how many eggs does that crank out on like a weekly basis? You get a dozen a day. A dozen a day. So you can pretty much be egg people if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a hard time eating them all. Oh, yeah? We give them away, so them whatever you want. For sure. So we have a deal where if somebody asks for eggs, they buy them. I saw this thing that there's a people are trying to bring back an old style of storing eggs where they put it in lime water. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I tried that. Yeah, they were. Store your eggs. Do you like the pickle eggs? eggs. The brand name costs way too much, but you can get the knockoffs, which are just as good. I think you switch out the, the blocks of ice that we freeze, and then you have a refrigerator. So, yeah, okay. I have, I made a new insulated box, and then we have a cooler there. How long will that last, um, if you put some bags of ice in there, I mean, if it's insulated? Uh, during the summer, we'll change it uh, every other day. Okay. But the winter, maybe once a week. Wow. Let me keep the box of ice in here. We'll have the cake in there for later. Hey! Same kind of freezer we have. It's pretty similar. <laughs> yeah. We, we, uh, the one thing we took with us when we moved up here in the camper is we put a full-size freezer like Hi. this. And so right now it's just sitting outside the camper because uh, yeah. we don't have the space yeah. in the refrigerator. <laughs> this is joint. So, so roughly, it's over here until August of that next year. Okay. Yeah. But the off trade to replace the Lincoln. So um, this is our, this tank fills up way faster than mine, than my house does. It just it collects the whole side of that roof. Oh, yeah. And it fills up really quick. Like an inch of rain will fill it up or something like that. Uh, you need four inches of rain. Four inches of rain will fill that tank. It, it's, wow. it's always full. Yeah. And then we have, uh, under here, she keeps a cover. So under here, we have a solar powered washing machine. Yeah. 
That's what we use for So before she does laundry, she has to check the batteries and make sure there's at least eight amps coming into the system. And that's enough to run the wash machine and the freezer. So just do laundry on really sunny days. Yeah. Okay. Do you guys hang you or can, Yeah, hang you can't dry? dry your clothes anyway. Right, yeah. 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 So you dry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No need for a dryer when you got the sun. Right. No. No. So okay. eight amps. Got to have eight amps. Otherwise, it drains the gas. Is this just to keep it weather? Yeah. Good? The debris, yeah. like fall leaves yeah. are falling right now. Doing everything. Yeah. Have you guys looked into those uh, magnets? Uh, washing clothes with your with two big magnets. So we we got introduced to this just uh, like a year and a half ago. I went to somebody's house in, in Ohio, and they washed my clothes. And uh, they, I was like, "Do I need to go get some detergent or something?" They said, "No, grab the two big magnets on the on the wall." And so what you do is there's these two big ball magnets, and you put them in the washing machine. And sometimes they'll just clip to the side of the, the drone cycle, but it ionizes your clothes and it causes all the dirt and the grime and stuff to come off. And you can put oh. essential oils. Oh, yeah? We've uh, totally stopped using detergents and stuff. Yeah. And our clothes will come out smelling yeah. good. Yeah, that's amazing. So it's, yeah. it's uh, cheap, too. You don't yeah. have to pay for detergent. Huh. But yeah, it's just like the one we, one we, we would use because they had, like, uh, the free and clear didn't have all the perfumes and dyes and stuff. Mm -hmm. like so, but, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. We used to, we used to make our own... Uh, Detergent. Jamie would do that sometimes, yeah. but this when she didn't have time, this is what we use. We didn't have all the other stuff in it. But yeah, at some point, I'd like to get away from that. But look it's easy. Some magnets and tongue. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a long time to use these for wash, yeah. washing, washing by hand. Oh wow! So how would you guys like use this thing? You just so get you have, your soap you have clothes. A you have a bucket, and you, by the time you wash them, you and rinse them. And, and then you just strain it through the it through there. Then you hang it on the line. And hang it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we don't have a, a washing machine, so we've had to go to some laundromats and stuff since we've been away from back home where we can use some families and yeah. stuff. And so <laughs> Sierra was like, hey, take me to go get a, a plunger. I'm going to just try to use our bathtub. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Our bathroom. You can do that. You yeah. can do that. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've done that for sure. And during the winter, you get your plunger and you do it in the house. Yeah. I've got a Laverio in my house that I can use. What's a Laverio? It's a, it's like, it's kind of like that, but it's a big basket that goes up and down. Oh. Okay. And uh, like, we had a video on it. You know, Jamie really liked it. It's actually pretty easy. Cool. That's his workshop back there. It used to be a turkey coop. And you see, all the buildings have like rain catchment on them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if we need water in that area, it's always there. So you're using every single roof, pretty much, if you can. Almost. Yeah. yeah. To some extent. Is, is there any type of materials you don't want to collect water off of? Like like a you know tin like I don't know, tin roofs or something are fine, I'm guessing, but Yeah, they're fine. I mean well you're gonna if you're gonna be drinking, you're gonna have burky it anyway. Everything's gonna yes. filter, you know. So, yeah. so it, just any any water off of any surface pretty much. Yep. Yep. Now this is something you can't do in California and no. like that. I think they've lessened from what I've heard they've lessened some of their rules in California and Oregon. Uh, I think some so many people raised a fuss about it, uh, but yeah, you, you can get in trouble. Still, it just depends where you live. Lots of water out here. I hear no one cares. <laughs> yeah. And there's no enforcement. The, the, the state is broke. You know that's why I love about Arkansas. They're broke. They're poor. The state itself is poor, which means they can't hire enforcement to you know for codes. And I mean, they they wanted to do a code enforcement. Uh, when it came to septic systems and making sure homesteads had proper septics or compost, things like that. But the county's like, with what money? How are you going to hire someone who's going to get an inspector? They have no money. They're broke. Which so, is good. I like wow, that they're broke. Wow, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they can't send It's only when these counties get on. rich with, with tax dollars and they get in, all up in your business. Mm -hmm. So, what is there any ways that this area, like where they do, if they have any issues politically or like? There's a know? good old boy network here. Okay. Okay. Just stay out of it. <laughs> There's a good old boy network, and that's the way it is everywhere. You know, so you go into even St. Louis, you know, where I live, there was a good old boy network, you know, with, with politicians and stuff. And unless you're part of in that system or invited in, you don't you don't get into it very easily. Out here, it's the same way. You just there's a good old boy network, you know, and, and be, be nice for the neighbor, be involved in your community, and you'll be all right. So, you were saying there's like 10,000s of Hebrews out here. 
Uh, has anybody thought about doing local government type <coughs> stuff? Like, um, I mean, if you got we to... have thought about that. In fact, we got there's a couple people in our area who thought about maybe going on to the county commission, um, county council, things like that, so that we have a voice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, that that'll happen more and more. I'm sure. I mean, I don't want to be in charge of nothing. You live longer. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be in charge of nothing like that. But like two or three minutes, it's butter, and then uh, I save that in my cooler. And that's butter for the week for everything we need. And then wow. cheese. I make mozzarella cheese, and I can shred that cheese, put it on tacos, whatever. I want to learn how to make mozzarella. <laughs> <laughs> she, she had a really good video out there that make mozzarella, and it's good. I mean, it's like I love it. I love the mozzarella. You make what they call farm cheese or something? Yeah, I use that with vinegar. I think I've never made it, but this is so. I love the mozzarella so much. Unless I had to, I, I wouldn't make it. What is feta cheese made out of? Uh, usually goat. Goat. Yeah, yeah and goat. it's yeah, a different it's enzyme. Yeah. 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 And the coat is. So you can make all different kinds of different cheeses. Else. It just depends on the enzyme <laughs> you have and. You know, the technique of how you're going to age it. You know, like cheddar needs to be aged. Yeah. I don't need all that. Just, I, what's that phrase? I don't, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Just make me my mozzarella. I can make it in 30 minutes, an hour, tops, and it's done. Put it in the cooler, and I can go on with my life. Cool. I got cheese for the week. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Zayla, what do you think about all those sheep? Look at those sheep. Look at those sheep, Zayla. Freaking out, huh? <laughs> Don't eat sheep poop. Oh my goodness, stop that. Gross. Alright, so I'm taking my first composting toilet plunge. Uh, I think this is how it works. You just do your do, dump it over top, and yeah, pretty cool. Doesn't smell so bad. That's not bad. Cool. Composting toilet check all right so what's up we are here at zach bauer's place with new tutora and american homestead and zach is going to be showing us uh his wine making process um he's already kind of brewed a, a big uh, jar thing here but what are we actually going to be doing zach so we're going to do what's called racking so we're going to take the the leaves the bible speaks in uh it's uh, isaiah 25 verse 6 of the lees, um, that gives us the, the menu of, of, the, of the final uh, feast of Sukkot, you know, that we talk about with the Messiah. Yeah. It says he will drink wine that is well refined off the lees. And this is the lees. This is the stuff you don't want. And so when you rack wine, you take the wine off the lees. And then you do that a number of times so that the wine clarifies and becomes clear, becomes pure. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take the wine off the lees. Uh, the first step in the process of making this drinkable, because right now it, it'll taste all right, but, you know, it can always be better. So it's a very young wine. I made this this last year. We harvested grapes. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to rack the wine. Very cool. All right. Well, show us what we got to do. I'm going to make you do it. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so first thing you're going to do is you're going to come over on this side here. Let me see if we can. Okay, I got you. We can get you good. And um, what you're going to do is you're going to put this on the ground by your feet. Okay, all right, here we go. And we're going to siphon what's in here down to there. Now, take take this off. Can you move this off like like there? Oh, yeah, just kind of pop her out. Right by now. And take a smell. Tell me what you think. Smell good? Yeah, yeah. Good? Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. All right. All right so what we're going to do is we're going to take this and put the hose down in there. Okay, and we just sanitized all this with boiling water. Right. Everything is clean. That's the most important thing of winemaking. Everything must be clean. All right, and I put this down a little... All right, and you're going to squeeze the bulb there, and it's going to begin to... You can put it down as far as you want. It doesn't matter. Okay. We may get some sediment. It's okay. We'll rack it multiple times throughout the year. Wow. Now, once you get it going, it should automatically go without... Gravity, the siphon should take over. It should be going now. Is it going? Let's see. Yeah, I see I see it moving. Yeah, it's going. All right. Definitely going. All right, it's going through. Now, here's what we do. We're going to take a taste. Let me get the glass real quick. See if this is any good. Hopefully it will be. All right. 
Now, Zach, what is uh, what's your common answers to those teetotalers out there that have an issue with with uh, biblical wine making? Uh, that's easy. Uh, the grapes are harvested in the summer. The grapes are harvested in the summer, and they were drinking at Passover time, the Last Supper, we commonly call it. What time of the year was that? In the spring. In the spring. So how in the world did they keep grapes good enough to drink, the juice good enough to drink, without refrigeration, without manufacturing, without pasteurization? Fruit pasteurization wasn't invented until the 1700s by a guy named Thomas Bramwell Welch. Welch is grape juice. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar. So if that's the case, how did they preserve their juice all that time? They used a preservative called alcohol. So at the Last Supper, they were drinking wine from grapes harvested in the summer. They were drinking it in the spring, so it lasted all that time somehow. You're telling me Yeshua wasn't drinking grape juice? No, he was drinking. He was drinking wine, alcohol. Wine. Yeah. Wow. It actually smells really good. It's got really good uh, fruit. You smell the fruit? It smells really fruity. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So. Okay, we're good. Mm. Okay, so this is this is a Norton grape that we're doing. Um, taste that and see what you think. I think it's really good. Norton grape. Now you were saying something. Norton grapes are special to this area of the country. Or? Yeah, so they're they're um, very familiar with this part of the country. You'll taste a little bit of bitterness, a little a little acidity. Wow, I really like that. Yeah, that's really good. That's amazing. Yeah, it's probably the one of the best wines I've made. Actually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the first. This is my first tasting of this particular one. So we harvested these Norton grapes uh, this summer. And um, Norton, or otherwise sometimes called Cynthiana grapes, are very common to this part of the country. Um, in fact, in the 1800s, 1870s, they won a gold medal at the World's Fair in Vienna. A guy from Missouri, Ozarks, took his Norton grapes and beat out all the French. And oh, wow. They were, they were really ticked off about that. It's all blind tasting. They don't know who it is, you know. So... Uh, Anyway, this is a very famous grape, the Norton grape. It's very much on par with like a dry wine, Cabernet Sauvignon, or a Merlot, maybe. But um, that's really good. That it, it's delicious. It's very good. <laughs> she could, you want you want to try just a taste? I know it's you know I know you're pregnant and everything. But, um, <laughs> it's got some acidity. It's got some tartness that will mellow out over time. And also, I'm tasting a lot of the. Of the yeast, I, I can taste a definite yeast residue in this, and that's because that's what we're doing here. We're, we're going ahead and getting all of um, uh, that taken out, so we're going to get as much of that juice as possible. Even though it, I know we're getting some of that leaves in there, it's okay. Now, what what is this stuff here, and and what do you do with it once you kind of separate the liquid out from it? Hold on, let me get this. Siphon going years ago. It was kind of pinching up here at the top a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I think oh. it's going now. Okay. All right, say that again. So the the lees, you know, what is that, and what do you do with it once you're done separating the liquid? Uh, we'll throw it out. Throw it out in the garden. You can compost it, whatever. It's real nutritious. There's all kinds of nutrition in there. So if you put it in the garden, the microbes in your garden will love you. But um, I'll just throw it in the backyard, and it'll smell for a few days, and. Actually, so this is parts of the uh, the like the actual grapes that just been squished. Well, what happens when you introduce the yeast? The yeast uh, eat the sugars and they produce alcohol. They also produce a carbon carbon uh, dioxide gas, you know, okay. CO two. Yeah. And then they also expel an excrement. That's what that is. Gotcha. So it's uh, yeast poop leavings. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeast poop. And so you get rid of it, and uh, you take it off, and you keep doing these rackings over and over again until your wine is done, and it's very clear. And so, yeah. Man, that's just... That's, that's good. I'm loving this. Yeah. When, once this is done in about a year, so I'll, next summer is when I will take this off of the carboy, and um, uh, it'll, it'll be going to, into bottles. So after we're done with this, I'm going to take this out, wash it out, dump it out. We're going to come back, and we're going to put some oak staves in there. And when we come back, we'll um, explain that a little bit better. So, But I need to go take this outside and get rid of it once this is done. We're almost, we're getting close. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll be right back, and we'll be putting some oak staves and some stuff. 
Look at that purple sludge. Yeah, that stuff's... Looks like a, a smoothie. Like a, like a grapes, like a... Yeah, that would definitely upset your stomach, I think, if you drank that. Really? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I've never done it. I wonder if there's some type... I mean, people drink kombucha and all that kind of stuff, and that's pretty you much... You could start a new batch of wine with that. It would probably be really flavorful if you kept it, like an old yeast. You know, like, wow, like a leaven. Kept adding. Yeah, that's basically a leaven is what that is now. So you could take that and use it to leaven bread or, I mean, not leaven, but start a new batch of fermentation for the... Um, I wonder if there's any historical use that, you know, other than just throwing it out to the garden, if people have used it for anything. They would use it for the next batches of just, wine. Just and they they believe that the more you carry it on over for each cycle, you actually get more flavor. Um, I'm not that hardcore, though. Historical yeast. That it has it has a age and heritage. <laughs> yeah, they would keep it and they would yeah. do that with it. But, um, okay, so what I need to do is get this... I'm gonna rinse this out. I can't just use that out there. So, Zach, we've uh, dumped all the purple sludge into the yard for the chickens. So, you said you're gonna have some drunk chickens out there if they stumble upon it. <laughs> and they will. They like it. <laughs> it's uh, good eggs. So, uh, now we're just transferring it back from this container to the glass one. Right. And then we're gonna top it off. So, here we go. So, this is like the, the little. Uh, siphoner, you squeeze the pump here and should be going. Okay, it's moving. Nice. All right, look at that. So now what we're going to do, we have these pieces of white oak and this is what it's called Coopers. Um, Coopers will make barrels of white oak and they'll toast the inside of the barrel with, with fire and sometimes they'll toast them under different circumstances a medium or a heavy toast this is kind of a medium a heavy medium heavy and uh, so I've basically burned the edges of these pieces of white oak and these will go inside the carboy and will give that same sort of taste profile that you would get from a charred oak barrel and so I'll switch these out over the num next number of months uh, I'll put eight of them in today and uh, what I'll use with these later on you can take uh, a neutral spirit like a distilled the distilled spirit, and then put these in with that, and then it'll transfer that grape flavor into that alcohol. So you can reuse these things uh, later on when you're done. It provides wow. an amazing flavor to like a rum or a, a brandy or something, you know, something like that. So you keep these when you're done. So yeah, we'll take these, put them in there, and they'll soak in there for the next six months. So instead of needing a full-blown barrel, you just make some little sticks and mm -hmm. shove yep. them in there. It works just as good, Wow. if not better. So. Yep. So uh, with the flavor of the smokiness, like, like, is there something you're going for when you create a wine in terms of like how much smokiness or whatever type of flavors you add? Like, is there some like epitome of wine we're chasing the flavor of? Is no, just... the majority of flavor for wines come from the yeast. Uh, yeast hold all those profiles. Like, for instance, there's um, a number of brewer, like rice wine. Rice wine is only made with rice. But if you incorporate a certain yeast into it, when you taste that rice wine and smell that rice wine when it's finished, you'll get notes of roses or notes of different fruits like citrus or uh, tangerine or different tropical fruits. Where did that come from? It's just rice. Well, it came from the yeast because the yeast carries that over. It's, in, it's, in, it's embodied in the yeast, in the makeup of the yeast. It's a fungus. Wow. And so it, it retains all those notes and then expels them into whatever you're making when it's, when it's, when it's used. And so uh, oak, the only thing oak gives is more of a uh, vanilla, caramel notes and flavorings. Uh, it provides a smoothness to it. Um, it helps, uh, I think, helps mellow out some of the tannins that may be inside the wine. Uh, helps mellow out some of the acidity that's inside the wine, like the bitterness you could taste when you tasted this. Yeah. It's because it's a new wine. It'll help mellow that out um and so they discovered this kind of by accident throughout history they would transport these in oak barrels and they realized that the transported wine tasted better than the wine that was new when oh. it was done you know without the oak barrels and so yeah that's what we do we'll put those in there and uh, a lot of the notes that you that you taste because people will taste a grape wine they'll pick up all kinds of other things like citrus or or florals different florals and it's all coming from the yeast Wow, that's cool. All right, well, we'll check back once we filled up this big container. We're almost done. <laughs>
All right, so now we're gonna put these oak staves in and these will be in there for the remainder of the time of the wine. And they kind of float at first, but as they take on the wine, they'll soak down, they'll, they'll sink down as they soak and that'll provide an amazing oak flavor. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna to top off with more wine to make sure there's no head space in here or very little head space. We're just gonna fill up the rest of this uh, carboy. Now, is there a specific choice of wine that you top it off I'll try with? to find something similar. I couldn't find a Norton, uh, so I found a Cabernet, which Norton is kind of similar to. And um, the reason you do this is because if you allow too much oxygen in here, you're going to oxi oxidize the wine. And you can tell wine has been oxidized when you put it in a glass and you kind of swirl it and you hold it up to a white background, you'll see a brown edge along the edge of the, of the, of the liquid against the white background. It's normal for wine to oxidize a little bit in the bottle and over time, but um, if you want to keep those fresh fruit notes, uh, you'll, you'll prevent it from doing that by adding topping off your carboys. Now, uh, we've done this, you know, this is the first time you did it with this batch. How many more times are you going to do this process? Approximately two or three more times. And after that, you bottle it, and how long do you wait? Preferably two years, although sometimes I try along the way. <laughs> a, little, a little taste here and there, right? Wine, wine is a testimony of patience. So if, you make, if you're a good winemaker, you have great patience. Sometimes I'm more patient than others. Oh. But, um, yeah. I'm going to get me a... You know. Very cool. So uh, in about two years' time, if you're patient enough, we might get to try some of this big batch here, huh? That's correct. That looks... That's a beautiful color. Yeah. It's really good. It's going to look fantastic in about two years. Or, well, in about six months. I told, told Jake, when this gets bottled, it'll be bottled sometime around next summer. I'll figure out a way to get a bottle to him. Awesome. I look forward to it. Well, thanks, Zach, for showing us how to do the winemaking process and siphon off the green gook, you know, the yeast poop, and uh, and get this uh, this setup going. That's awesome. And, and what is this thing right here? This, this is this is an airlock. It's a bubble airlock. It keeps oxygen out. So this will continue to expel some CO2 um, with the fermentation. There's also malactic fermentation that's going on, and it's going to press, you know, that all that out. But you have the airlock there, so oxygen cannot get back in. Awesome. Well, very cool. Thank you for showing us your winemaking process, Zach. Go make some wine. All right. Coming in for the pre-dinner forecast. We got Sierra right here cooking up our favorite kimbap. We got some good uh, cooked tuna, seasoned tuna, and uh, avocado and eggs in the middle there. I'm right now working on the special sauce right here. And, uh, and of course, Zach's over here stirring up some fried rice. Look at that. That's me, gonna go with the fried rice. I got some other ingredients to add to it. It's gonna be delicious. I'm so hungry. And you guys are looking forward to food too. <laughs> This place is awesome. Look, she's transitioned to the front. Yeah. Zayla. I think her leash is still back there. Zayla. Zayla. What are those sheep doing? Look at those sheep. Are you eating sheep poop? Zayla. Dog. What are you doing? Gross. Stop that. Stop that. Hey, Zach. I'm gonna go home and read my Bible. Yeah, that's right. You do that. <laughs> We're on our way home and still driving on gravel roads. I can only go like 15 miles an hour. Sierra gets upset if I drive her car too crazy. <laughs> We're taking our time, but eventually we'll get out of here. But just wanted to show off this beautiful. Ozark sunset. What an awesome adventure going down here and getting to check out the homestead. 
All right, well, we'll make it home eventually. We're so off in the boonies, it'll take us a while, though. All right.